Well, thus far in our study of Mark's Gospel, and specifically Mark's Gospel as he presents what we call the Passion Narrative, we've been taking a very good look at Jesus and how Jesus is presented, and we've seen that Jesus is the abandoned Savior. We see also that Jesus is a submitted Savior. He's submitted to God's will and purpose. We saw last week that Jesus is the betrayed Savior, betrayed by those closest to Him. This morning we're going to see that Jesus is also the condemned Savior, the Savior who was condemned. Now let's think about the term condemned, condemnation or condemned. Okay? The, the dictionary definition of condemned is declared to be reprehensible, wrong, or evil. Or it's to be pronounced guilty and sentenced to punishment, especially sentenced to death. Now, I want you to think for a second about, about who and what we condemn in our society today. We condemn murderers and criminals, don't we? Okay? A murderer will be condemned either to life in prison or to, in states that have the death penalty, to death, right? So, so as a state, we condemn people to really the ultimate form of punishment if they commit what we consider those kind of heinous crimes like that. But we also condemn criminals to time in prison. When a, when a criminal uh, breaks certain laws, we condemn them to a certain amount of time that they need to spend in prison. So that's one kind of condemnation that we do as a people. We also could condemn a home or a building. If we see that that building or that home is not fit, it's, it, it's in some way unsafe for people to live in, that that house may or that building may be condemned where people can no longer go into it. We also as a society typically will condemn certain forms of speech or certain heinous acts towards people that we see as, as just particularly wrong. And so most of us in a thinking society will condemn uh, acts of racism against various different ethnic groups because we see that as so heinous, as so out there, that they're really not appropriate uh, for uh, the way that we ought to live in our society. We condemn those type of things. And in those cases, condemnation can be a very good thing. But condemnation can also be used in very ugly ways, can it? And we're going to see one form of very ugly condemnation in Scripture. But I was thinking this week as I was thinking about what Jesus experienced. And there's a, there's a form of condemnation that is, is very popular today. And I saw a correlation uh, with, with, with that time, uh, with something lesser that we do today, uh, that's an ugly form of condemnation. And, and you may have heard of it. It's on the news a lot right now. It's called cancel culture. Have you heard that? <laughs> That, 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 that terminology, cancel culture, basically the concept behind cancel culture is that usually it's something that happens online or, or with people uh, on the internet, but it can happen in other ways also. Basically the idea behind cancel culture is somebody says or does something that a group of people find so wrong, so not fitting for society that they set out to cancel that person. They want to get them fired, they want to get them removed from the Air. They want to really do everything they can to push that person off to the fringes of society where they'll no longer be able to say or think or do the things that those group of people don't like. And I was thinking about kind of some of what's behind cancel culture. Uh, and some of the things that I noticed about that's behind cancel culture is cancel culture is based on how uh, or how what you believe or what you say makes someone else feel. It's not really necessary about something that you do to somebody else or you do to some group of people, but it's ultimately how you make somebody feel because of what you believe or what you say. Cancel culture is also based usually on half-truths or mischaracterizations of the truth. It's taking something somebody says and bending it in such a way so it fits the narrative that you're trying to push for a particular time. The thing that's probably most concerning about cancel culture is it's devoid of grace. There's no grace involved in it. We, we see people that will, will get canceled and they'll come out and they'll apologize for what they do. And, and, and it's not like the people who were attacking them will go, oh, okay, since you apologized, we'll forgive you and move on. No, typically that's where they see the juggler and they go after it. It's devoid of grace. 
And really, it ignores two of the core principles of our society. And those core principles are free thought and free speech. That we believe that we live in a country where people are free to think things that we think are stupid, quite frankly. That's part of freedom. Freedom means that, that, that my neighbor can, can have a thought that I think is dumb, and they're free to have that thought. And, and they're also free to say things that I, freak, uh, that, I, that, I, that I frankly just don't agree with, that I just think is wrong. But I have the ability to, you know what? Not listen. Our society has always believed in free thought and free speech, but cancel culture is beginning to wipe a lot of that out, unfortunately. But ultimately, cancel culture is also self-defeat. That it eventually will be self-defeating because you can't cancel people enough until the point where you're going to start canceling one another. And so the people who started canceling certain groups of people eventually are just going to start canceling one another. And we've even seen that in the media. Some of the writers who were, were big on trying to cancel various different people, all of a sudden they, see, they say something that certain people don't like, and guess what? Now we've got to cancel you. <laughs> you know, I got to thinking about that this week, and I saw a correlation with the, the scripture that we're going to look at this morning. Now, of course, cancel culture is nothing to the degree of what Jesus faced. It's a toned-down version of what Jesus faced, but yet I see some correlations there. Look at the correlations. Their hatred for Jesus was based on how they felt about Jesus and what he said, not about the merits of his claims. Never once do you see the religious leaders attacking the merits of Jesus' claims. They attack him because of how they felt about what he was saying and what he was thinking. We also see that they're willing to believe anything that was said about him if it fit the verdict that they had already jumped to. No matter what, what, what somebody said, if it was negative against Jesus, they're like, well, I can believe that. Why can you believe it? Because we don't like him. There was no grace in their heart. None whatsoever. They weren't interested. Jesus could have said everything that they wanted to hear, and they still wouldn't have extended grace to him. Praise God that he didn't. They completely ignored their own rules, their own laws, and most importantly, the scriptures. They ignored all of those. Those didn't matter to them anymore because they wanted to get to a verdict, and that verdict was the verdict that they already had established, and that was guilty. And ultimately, though, their plans of stopping Jesus and the movement that was developing around him failed epically. It failed epically. If their desire was to stop Jesus, and more importantly to them, stop the Jesus movement, how did that work out for them? Not so well. This morning we're going to look and really see this epic failure laid out as we see the Jewish religious establishment condemn Jesus. And from that, we're going to see three vital implications that we ought to take to heart. So if you haven't already, turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, and we're going to look at verses 53 through 65. Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 53. And they led Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. Now stop there for just a second. Jesus has been arrested. And we looked at that last week as Jesus was arrested in the garden. And now he's taken to the first of six trials that he will experience. As we harmonize the Gospels together, we see that Jesus faced six different trials. Three of them to the religious authorities and three of them to the civil authorities that Jesus will go through during this time. Now, one of the big questions that often comes up, uh, especially looking at this particular trial that Jesus would face, is people will say, well, that was an illegal trial. And there's some strong arguments to be made that this was an illegal trial, that this was not the way it was supposed to be handled. That especially if you compare with what the Mishnah said, which really is an interpretation of how to best interpret the law, the Old Testament law, and the traditions of Judaism, that, that really what they did to Jesus breaks everything that the Mishnah says about a trial. 
The problem is, is that that was all put together in about 220 AD, far time after this experience happened. So maybe this was an illegal trial. Maybe it wasn't. We don't know for sure. And that's not really the point here. In fact, I believe what's going on here is what we see as an interrogation. Yes, it's a form of a trial, but it's more of an interrogation. Think about for a second, most of us have seen some sort of cop drama, right? Some sort of a detective drama. And one of the things that they do when they have a suspect is they'll take him and they'll put him in a room, right? Put him in a room with a table and just a couple of chairs. And then the police officers, the detectives, they come in and what do they do? They try to get the person to confess, don't they? They try to get the person to confess because if they confess to a crime, then it makes the prosecution a lot easier. And so what's going on here, what I see going on here, is very much an interrogation. They want Jesus to admit that all of the, the, the verdict that they've already established is true. And so they bring them here, uh, him here before some of the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin was the highest court of the land for Judaism. It was made up of 70 men plus one, so 71 in the high priest. But chances are pretty good the entire Sanhedrin wasn't here. To have a quorum, they had to have 28. So it's about 28 or more who were there meeting at this time with the high priest, who at that time was Caiaphas. And they're interrogating Jesus. They want Jesus to say something or do something to implicate himself. And that's where we find Jesus. Now verse 54, we looked at verse 54 a couple weeks ago, and it's about Peter. And there's a great interplay that Mark does here between uh, Peter, who was unfaithful, and Jesus, who in the midst of the most trying circumstances ever in the history of mankind, is faithful to the end. But that's not our focus this morning, so we're going to skip over verse 54 and look at verse 55 and following. It says, Now the chief priest and the whole council was seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many more false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say that I will destroy this temple uh, that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this, their testimony did not agree. So it says here that they were seeking testimony against Jesus. What this tells us is that they had already made up their minds about Jesus, so all they were doing really is they were looking for a stronger legal case to bring to the Romans. Okay? This was, this in essence, this interrogation, they had already come to the point where they were ready for the punishment phase. They didn't want to hear any sort of uh, cross-examination of Jesus. They didn't want to hear anything in the positive of Jesus. So what did they do? They went and rounded up some witnesses. Why? Because again, they wanted to bring him before the Romans. Why bring him before the Romans? Well, I think that there's two reasons why they wanted to bring him to the Romans. The first one is the easy part. Within Roman law, in order to maintain the Pax Romana, they kept hold on the ability to legally execute people. Now, there are some times in Judaism where, where they would stone people to death, and that was kind of a, 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 kind of a fuzzy area, but ultimately what they want here is they want Jesus to be legally executed by the Romans. They couldn't do that, the Jewish leadership couldn't do that, so they wanted the Romans to do that for them. For one, they wanted him executed. The other reason is, remember, at this time, Jesus was still relatively popular with the crowds. It wouldn't be until a little bit later that they would turn much of the crowd against Jesus. But at this time, the crowds were still behind Jesus. I believe part of the reason that they did this was because if the crowds turned on them, they could make the Romans into a scapegoat. Oh, well, no, it was them. So it's a great scapegoat for him. So it says that many bore false witness against him. What this means is they gathered up a bunch of people who had heard Jesus speak or heard somebody talk about Jesus speaking, and they came to bear witness about him, but all of their witness was false. What that means is that they got before and they testified to something, 
but somebody else would come and testify to something different and it would contradict their case. So if you were to imagine this, this interrogation scene, and in here and they bring a witness, and a witness says, I heard Jesus say this. Somebody else comes, well, I heard Jesus say that. And they're like, man, we can't get a testimony that agrees with one another. They just needed two people to testify to the same thing. Because then they could take it to the Romans and say, see, we have two people that heard Jesus curse God. Because ultimately, according to Jewish law, in order for them to execute Jesus, he had to say something that was a direct curse at God. But none of them could say that. Why? Because Jesus never said such a thing. Then it says that somebody came and said, well, I heard him say he would destroy the temple. He said that he would destroy the temple with his own hands and that he would rebuild it in three days. Well, what's going on here? What's going on really is that this person or a couple of people are conflating two things that Jesus said. One we find in Mark, the other we find in John. In Mark, as, as the, the disciples are reveling at the beauty of the temple, Jesus says, you see this place? Not one stone is going to be laid upon the other. What is he doing? He's prophesying about what would happen in AD 70 when Titus would come and knock the temple down and destroy Jerusalem. So he's prophesying that this great temple that you see, it's not going to be here all the time. Did Jesus say that he was going to do it? Nope. He did not. Then we look in John, and as he's talking to the disciples, He's talking again about the temple, but there he says that destroy this temple, and in three days I will rise it again. And of course, what does John say? He was speaking about his body. He doesn't say that he would destroy the temple. He says, if you destroy the temple, in three days, this temple, my body, in three days I will rise it again. Again, is he prophesizing here? You better believe he is. But what they're doing is they're conflating these two things that Jesus said and putting it together. But what does it say? Yet, even about this, their testimony didn't agree. And so at this time, I imagine this scene of this interrogation, and the high priest is getting angry at this point. Man, he want, this was the best testimony that money could buy, and now it's all falling apart. What are we going to do? Well, look at what happens in verse 60. It says here in verse 60, And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is this that these men testify against you? It said, But, G but he remained silent, and he made no answer. So the high priest is getting frustrated. And so instead of, instead of trying to find better witnesses, he just decides, you know what, forget it. I'm going to get up and I'm going to get Jesus face. Goes, hey, what about all this testimony? Do you have anything to say about all of these people who are testifying about you? He's hoping that Jesus incriminates himself. He's hoping that Jesus starts to make some sort of fancy excuse. Or says, well, what I actually said in that situation was this. Why? Because these guys were masters at rhetoric. And they were masters at taking what Jesus said and turning it around for their own purposes. But it says he remained silent. Part of the reason that he remained silent is there was no reason to refute false testimony. The witnesses were doing the job that a defense attorney would do for Jesus. Because they were so bad. Because they were so false in what they were saying. But it also, and more importantly, fits with what was prophesied of Jesus in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb was led to slaughter, and like a sheep before its shears was silent, so he opened not his mouth. Jesus perfectly fulfills the scripture about himself. So look at what it says. And again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Now, suddenly, suddenly he's getting at the heart of the issue. He asked him an important question. All of these people are saying you're a Messiah. Are you the Messiah, 
the Son of the Blessed, the Son of God. Now understand, there's nothing in Jewish law that says that if Jesus said that he was the Messiah, that that would give them reason legally to kill him. Nothing in Jewish law that said that. In fact, there were multiple times where people claimed to be the Messiah. Nothing in Jewish law at that time that claimed that they had the right to kill him. But they're trying to lead him to a point where they can call him a false prophet. And get rid of him. Look at Jesus' answer. Jesus' answer is powerful. It says, Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. This is a powerful test, uh, testimony. In fact, I would argue that this statement by Jesus is the climactic point of John's or Mark's gospel. Mark's gospel builds up to this statement that Jesus makes. Throughout Mark's gospel, we have what we call the messianic secret. Okay? And the messianic secret is the idea that Jesus would often tell people who, who realized that he was the Messiah, they, they, they would say, he would say, don't tell, don't tell anybody. Why? Because his time had not come yet. Now Jesus' time has come. Jesus recognizes that he's at his time, and his time has come. Now is the time where he can no longer deny it, and so now he says, yes, I am. This is the first time Jesus has publicly claimed to be the Messiah. Why? Because the time is nigh. The time has come. The rest of Jesus' statement here is powerful. It comes from Psalm 110, verse 1, and more importantly, Daniel chapter 7. Psalm 110, verse 1, it says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. There's an idea of judgment that comes here. And then in Daniel chapter 7 it says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and it was presented before him, and it was to give him dominion and, a, and glory and a kingdom, and that all the peoples and all the nations and all the languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. When Jesus made this statement, this statement is not just simply saying, I am the Messiah. It is he's saying the Messiah, but he's saying even more than that. What Jesus is saying here is he's giving no ambiguity. He's being very clear. Not only was he the Son of God, he was the divine Son of Man who was, would be sitting at the right hand of God. He not only came as the powerful Messiah, he came as God with us, Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. Just as promised. He would come to save his people, but he would also come to, to judge in perfect righteousness. And the religious leaders understood that's exactly what he was getting at. That's, that's why their response is the way that it is. Look at what it says that they, that they did. And the high priest tore his garment. Now in that culture, for the high priest to tear his inner robe, that was an ultimate sign of consternation. That was, in essence, saying what this man said is so blasphemous, is so wrong, that it hurts me to hear this. And so he rips his, 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 his robe and said, what further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him, and to cover his face and to strike him, saying, prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. They recognized what Jesus was saying. That Jesus wasn't simply making a claim of being the Messiah. That Jesus was claiming to be the Son of God. The Holy One. The One equal with God. And they recognized that actually when Jesus' testimony, he did more than they were even asking So they say, clearly, this one deserves death. And then they humiliate and mistreat Jesus in a way that is hard to even read. We don't have to look at a lot of the cultural appropriation 
Or, or what does that mean to that particular culture to understand? Spitting on someone is still an ultimate form of humiliation. Covering his eyes and then smacking him. That was the, the idea behind that was, was the belief that, that a prophet should be able to know somebody not just by looking at them, but also by their smell and by hearing them. So they blind him and then smack him and then ridicule him. If you're a prophet, you should know who I am. They beat Jesus and humiliate him. I said that there's three vital implications. And I want us to understand these three vital implications because really they take the text and they should hit us right in the heart as we consider them. The first one is this, and actually I would argue that the first one is the most important one. That's why we started off with it. It's this. Jesus endured humiliation and condemnation in order to save sinners from eternal humiliation and condemnation. Again, Jesus endured humiliation and condemnation in order to save sinners from eternal humiliation and condemnation. Never forget that all that Jesus endured, he endured it to save sinners from hell, like you and like me. Every blow that Jesus received is a blow that I should receive and that you should receive. Every time someone spit on him, I should be spit on. You should be spit on. Every time that Jesus was mocked, we should be mocked because we are sinners who fall short of the glory of God. Everything that Jesus endured, he endured to save sinners from eternal humiliation and condemnation. We ought to understand that the gospel is at center stage here. And the gospel is very clear. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And if that's where we were left, what a miserable people we would be. We would have no hope. And all we would look forward to when it comes to the next life is eternal separation from God. Eternal, constant humiliation. And ultimately, eternal condemnation. Away from our Lord. But Jesus came. Not only did he live a perfect life, not only did he teach in a perfect way, but he died. He took upon himself the humiliation and the condemnation that we should all rightfully deserve. That when we put our faith in him, God looks at us and he no longer sees a sinner deserving eternal punishment. But he sees the righteousness, not our own righteousness, because our, any righteousness of our own is just filthy rags. What he sees is he sees the righteousness of Christ. You see, at birth, every one of us, in our mother's womb, at, at conception, we all are imputed unrighteousness. Every single one of us is born, conceived, as unrighteous. It was, it was imputed from our first parents, Adam and Eve, and passed down from generation to generation to generation, and it will continue to be passed down. And if that wasn't enough, all of us choose in our actions to sin. We've got imputed unrighteousness and chosen unrighteousness. But here's the beauty. Christ Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection imputes his righteousness to undeserving sinners such as us when we put our faith. And so God no longer sees someone deserving of eternal humiliation and condemnation. He sees his own beloved sons and daughters. And that's grace, my friends. Jesus stands ready to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you of all righteousness if you put your faith in him. If you trust him as Lord and Savior, he will do that for you. Remember, Jesus endured all of this to save us from eternal humiliation and condemnation. Second is this. Jesus will one day condemn all those who condemn him by personal rejection and unbelief to eternal separation from God. 
Again, Jesus will one day condemn all those who condemn him by personal rejection and unbelief to eternal separation from God. This is the other side of the coin. This is the part in the modern church that we don't talk about quite as much. But it's important that we do. You see, in Jesus' statement, the high priest recognizes exactly what Jesus is saying. See, Jesus is making a bold statement here that he will eventually righteously judge those who are judging him in unrighteousness. Why? Why was he going to do that? Why was he able to do that? Well, that's what made him so angry. That's what made the high priest so angry. Because Jesus was saying that he was equal with God. And that's why the consternation, that's why the ripping of the shirt. Because he knew very well what Jesus was saying. The idea of Jesus judging the unrighteous doesn't fit with many people's pictures of Jesus today. Many people would like to paint a picture of Jesus. I've said many times, as the benevolent hippie in the sky who just wants to love and snuggle on us. Other people like to paint the picture of Jesus as a kindly grandparent, sitting up in heaven, saying, now you be nice to each other, treat one another nicely, and please come and visit me on the holidays, okay? Other people, and oftentimes this happens in, in the modern church grow at any cost movement that we often see within the church, is they paint a picture of, of Jesus as this desperate boyfriend trying so hard to woo back a girlfriend who has been dating other guys by showing off, look, I have new clothes and a new haircut, and I'm less high-strung than I was before. Please come back to me. None of these are the biblical picture of Jesus. Jesus is not a benevolent hippie in the sky. He is not a grandparent who's just begging people to come visit him. Or a desperate boyfriend who's saying, please come back to me. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's the advocate for his people. He's the good shepherd. But you know what he also is? He's the righteous judge. That's right. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the one with the sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth from Revelation. Jesus' statement in verse 62, is powerful and it's clear. So clear, in fact, that the high priest understands that Jesus is equating himself with God by ascribing God's honor to himself. In doing so, he clearly is telling them that one day he will judge them as they judge him. But he will judge them in righteousness where they judge him in unrighteousness. Why do we need to remember that? Well, it's the other side of what I shared before. Judgment is coming. And when we hear the gospel, when we hear the gospel truth, that Jesus died to save sinners, there's another side of that. If we hear that and we choose to reject him, what we're doing is we're condemning him as a liar. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In saying that statement, he's giving you a choice. Either you say, yes, no one comes to the Father except through Jesus, or you're saying, nope, Jesus lied about that. Nope, that's not true. We call Jesus a liar. We call Jesus a sinner. We call Jesus false as the high priest. And some of the Sanhedrin did. We too can understand that we stand condemned. So we have a choice as a people. Do we receive Jesus or do we reject him? That's the choice he's given us all. The last point is this. Jesus gives his followers an example to follow when we're condemned by others. Jesus gives his followers an example to follow when we are condemned by others. Many that are here this morning, and I'm sure many that are listening, on YouTube, through our video, have already trusted Jesus as Savior. Who, when they're given those two choices, made the right choice to put their trust and their faith in Jesus. Well, there's application, there's personal application for us too. 
Jesus ought to always be the ultimate example for us. The ultimate example that we strive after, and we see that here as well. Two things I want us to think about when we think about Jesus' response to being condemned by others. First thing I want us to notice is that notice that Jesus didn't refute their lies. Jesus didn't refute their lies, refusing to dignify their false accusations with a response. Jesus doesn't spend any time trying to refute the lies of liars. We should remember this, that those who condemn Jesus and his people are not looking to have their minds changed. I stopped responding to people on Facebook quite a while back because I realized something that I should have realized a long time ago. I'm an educated man, but it took me a while because I'm a man to figure this out. People who post stuff online are not looking for me to change their mind about things. They're just looking for other people to say, yeah, I agree with you on that. But they're not looking for me to share with a three-point uh, uh, response or rejection to what they're saying. They just want cheerleaders. And that's true in our lives as well. So many people are not looking to have their mind changed. It doesn't mean that we don't share the gospel. It doesn't mean that we don't take a stand for truth or, or stand for what is right. But understand that people just like those in the Sanhedrin were, who were standing around Jesus, they weren't looking for Jesus to say something that would exonerate him. And it's true of our lives too. Many people in our lives are not looking for us to say something that exonerates ourselves. We should remember that liars could care less about the facts. Liars can care less about the facts. I didn't say anything about our mainstream media. Don't get into that. If the shoe fits, wear it, but, you know, that's beside the point. Always remember, liars don't care about the facts. All they care about is their lies and their own version of facts. We should remember what Jesus said to his church when people say words against his church. Remember what he said in Matthew. Chapter 5, he said, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus says, if you're mistreated because of me, if you're maligned because of me, if you're attacked because of me, Consider yourself in good company. You know, a time very likely could be coming, church, when an evangelical church is seen in the same light as white supremacists, as terrorists, as murderers. You say, well, that can't possibly be. Oh, really? Oh, really? Look at how far our society has moved just in the last 10 to 15 years. It most certainly could happen. Especially evangelical churches that hold up that there is one way to heaven, and that's Jesus Christ alone. For some people, I just made a hateful statement. Maybe even YouTube will ban me. Because I say that there is only one way to be right with God, and that one way is Jesus Christ alone. Amen. We should never shy away from the truth, even if that truth is going to be unpopular with people. In fact, that brings us to the second part of this. When Jesus did speak, he boldly spoke the truth, which ultimately condemned him in the eyes of his accusers. Now, I know we said that, that, that they had already kind of reached their verdict, but they were able to very comfortably condemn him once he said what he said. They said, see, we don't need these false witnesses. He condemned himself because of what he just said. We should always remember this. Honest people will tell the truth even when it leads to pain and suffering. Honest people will tell the truth even when it leads to personal pain and suffering. Amen. 
Jesus gave us an example to follow. He didn't shy away from the truth. He boldly spoke the truth. At the exact right time, he spoke the truth. And that truth would ultimately lead to his crucifixion. But that truth would also ultimately lead to our salvation. We don't need to lie. We don't need to make excuses. We don't need to try to cover our tracks as believers. A time could be coming where things become even more difficult to be an evangelical believer. The church's response is bring it on. Why? Because our God is far more faithful than the faithlessness of the world around us. And we can trust Him completely. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you for your grace and your goodness. We thank you for the example that we see in Christ Jesus. Lord, help us to apply this truth to our life. Help us to, to want to respond like Jesus, to, to, to have the same attitude of Jesus who, even in the midst of liars, lying, false accusations thrown at him, didn't dignify their lives with a response. But then when it was appropriate time, spoke truth, even though that truth would ultimately lead to pain and suffering. Lord, if there's anybody here this morning or if there's anybody listening online that has not trusted you as Savior, I pray that each would realize that ultimately when it comes right down to it, we have two choices. Either Jesus is exactly who he said he was, or he's not. Lord, I pray that if anybody is wrestling with that question, Lord, that they would reach out to someone like myself or someone that they know in their life who knows you and would have a good discussion about what it is to trust you as Savior. I pray if there's anyone here this morning, anyone listening at home who needs to trust you as Savior, that they would do that, that they would receive forgiveness that you and you alone offer. And Lord, we thank you for your grace, and we thank you for your goodness. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.